<clears throat> I'll, uh, I think it's time to start, right? Where did I put my phone? Oh yeah, we're done. Sorry, I'm late. I'll uh, begin with scripture. So uh, this is Romans 3.23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, I think it's it's kind of a sobering verse, right? Like it's a reminder of, you know, we're all in the same place before before Jesus. And the only way we can have salvation is through him, you know. Anyway, so I'll begin with a word of prayer. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Um, thank you for the students, this class. Just ask you to bless our work today. Help us understand a little bit more about limits and the intermediate value theorem and all these things. Lord, in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Lest I forget... I know you guys will, the day won't feel the same unless I give you a top hat code, right? So, um, exciting. Very, very exciting. Let's see here. Although I do have an attendance sheet I mean to turn around to you guys. Um, so do you guys have any questions while I'm tinkering with this? All right, well, um, the exciting top hat code for today is 5218. All right, there we go. So um, let's look at an example. Because I, I think the example I did last time was fine, but it, it lacked a certain nuance that um, we'd kind of like to, to, to deal with. And so here's, here's one. Um, f of x be equal to, let us say, um, x, um, x squared minus 1 over x uh, minus 1 for x greater than 1, and um, let it be equal to uh, 2 <laughs> for x equals to 1, and let it be equal to let us say, oh, I don't know, um, cotangent of x minus 1 over um, Sorry, I'm thinking. Yeah, sure, sine. Now, x minus 1 for x greater than, uh, less than 1, rather. All right. And then the question is, is f continuous at x equals to 1? All right. So I just, I focused, I, I narrowed the focus of this question to just concern continuity at one, because it's actually more or less obvious that this function is continuous everywhere else, right? Did you guys see that? If I take the limit as x goes to a for a not equal to one, then you're dealing with an expression where you can just plug a in. You get a squared minus one over a minus one for a greater, for if, if a was greater than one, or you'd get cotangent of a minus one divided by um, a minus one for a less than one. Now, okay, that's not entirely true. Where is cotangent not continuous? It's not even defined where. What's, what is cotangent theta? Cotangent theta is cosine theta over sine theta, right? Yeah, so this, this guy, the domain, right? The domain of cotangent is what? It's, you know, the reals minus the set of n pi such that n is an integer. In other words, it's the reals um, except for those which are multiples of pi. Because the multiples of pi, integer multiples of pi, are places where sine is zero, right? So the domain of cotangent x minus 1 
you'd be looking, whenever x minus 1 is equal to n pi, you'd be in trouble, right? So this, this function is certainly not, um, not defined at 1 plus n pi, right? But setting those points aside, it would be continuous everywhere else except possibly 1, right? Like what, what's the deal with 1? What do we need to think about for 1? Continuity at 1 need, means what? We need that the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x is equal to f of 1, right? What is f of 1 equal to? 2, right? All right. So what do you guys think? Is it continuous at, at 1? So in order to understand this double-sided limit, we need to investigate the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of f of x, right? So what, what's that equal to? So x goes to the 1 from the right means we're looking at x a little bit bigger than 1, right? Right, you, so yeah, the, you got, you said, yeah, use this formula, right? The first, the, the top one. All right, and how does that work out? First of all, in, 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 in its initial formulation, it's type 0 over 0, right? But if we factor x squared minus 1 to x plus 1 times x minus 1, what do we get? Right, yeah, we just, we're just left with, uh, just like you told me, x plus 1, right? Which is itself, you know, a continuous expression at 1. We just plug 1 in. 1 plus 1 equals to 2. So that's good. That's good. However, how about the other side? What about the other side? What about x goes to 1 from the left, right? Limit as x goes to 1 from the left of f of x is actually equal to the other formula, right? Which is what? Cotangent of x minus 1 over x minus 1. Now we're in trouble because that's what? It's type 0 over 0, right? Is that true? Oh, no. Ooh. Huh. Oof. Oh man. Well, that just blows up. Rats. Fine. Just take our medicine. This is the limit. I mean, it is what it is. This could happen to us, so let's deal with it. I'll fix the example in a second here. So what that is, is cosine of x minus 1, right, divided by x minus 1 times the sine of x minus 1, right? I mean, this is something that happens. We have to be, you know, able to deal with it. So what, what kind of type are we looking at here? So we're, so this basically gives something of the form cosine of 0 over 0 times the sine of 0, right? In other words, this is what you might, it's type this, which is really 1 over 0, all right? What, is, is 1 over 0 an indeterminate form? It's not an indeterminate form. That just means this expression blows up. The question then remains, does it go to infinity? Does it go to minus infinity, right? Maybe we could figure that out. So what happens if you plug in? So for that, I think for this one, I would just, you know, let's just, let's just try to put in like 0.9, see what happens, right? So check it out. What happens if we look at cosine of 0 0.9 minus 1 over 0 0.9 minus 1 times the sine of 0 0.9 minus 1, right? You can get your calculator out and work it out, right? If you do it, 
the cosine's positive, 0.9 minus 1 is negative, and sine of 0.9 minus 1 is sine of minus 0.1, the sine of minus 0.1 is about minus 0.1. So it's negative. So what do you got? Altogether, positive, right? Which goes to show you this is equal to infinity. Oof. Very much not continuous. Right? So if, one, if, if, the left, if the left limit is infinity, the double-sided limit does not exist, right? In fact, this function has a vertical asymptote at 1, right? If either the left or the right limit is infinity or minus infinity, it's got a vertical asymptote. It's just got a funny thing because this, this, really, this, this is something we would not probably talk about in pre-calculus because we don't want to... Um, hurt the students' brains, you know? So like one, what's going on here? It's very weird, it's very weird. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, so basically you've got the line x equals to one, right? For x greater than one. So essentially you're dealing with, um, you know, it comes in here at two, the value's at two, and then there it is. This is y equals f of x, right? For x greater than one, that's the graph, right? But then this thing, cotangent over x minus 1, it's kind of like, uh, the thing is, I'm trying to think n equals to, I'm, I'm trying to remember where the next like, vertical asymptote is. It, for, it's like this, this function, it's, it's not defined. It's got vertical asymptotes where? At um, x equals to 1 plus n pi. If you think about it, that's where we have division by zero for the cotangent of x minus one. So where's like the next trouble spot for this function? Um, at one, one is one of them, right? But if we put n equals to minus one, what's one minus pi? Like minus 2.4, right? So funny stuff happens over here, right? Like this is one minus pi. And there continues to be funny stuff going on, right? So I, I don't know. I, I'd have to investigate further if it, uh, it probably, you know, I'm just going to go off my intuition, which is it does something like this. All right, but I haven't verified that it goes to minus infinity over here, but I suspect it's something like that. And then this just keeps going, repeating. Um, but it's, it's not just a cotangent, because it's cotangent divided by this thing, so it, it's something funky you haven't graphed before. But that's not a continuous function at one. So the answer is no, it is not continuous. Even though it's starting to look kind of good at the start of this, right? The two matched up, yay, half of it, but half is not the whole. Let's change this example ever so slightly. Let's take that cotangent and make it a, a tangent. See how this turns, see how this turns around, right? So if I have x squared um, I'll do the same thing. x squared minus 1 over x, uh, um, x minus 1, right? For x greater than 1, we'll define the value to be 2 at x equals to 1. And we'll make its formula c times the tangent of x minus 1 over x minus 1 for x less than 1. Now the question will be, the question will be this, choose c in the reals such that f is continuous at x equals to 1. All right? Let's see if we can do this. Now we've already done half of it in the previous example, right? So let's not reinvent the wheel. We already know that in the case, um, the you know case x is greater than one, we've got what we could same same calculation again. So we don't need to redo that, right? So we already know. Just to recap here, same calculation as in example one. We've already got that uh, the limit as x goes to one from the right of f of x is in fact equals to two, right? The interesting thing here is to calculate the limit 
as x goes to 1 from the left of f of x, right? So there we're up against the limit as x goes to 1 from the left of c tangent of x minus 1 divided by x minus 1, right? Now that is type 0 over 0, right? That's actually indeterminate. It doesn't just blow up. How do we understand this kind of limit? Well, let's, what, what do we know? What, what is tangent? Okay, so we've got C sine of x minus 1 divided by cosine of x minus 1, right, times x minus 1. And let me just rewrite this in a form which is a little bit easier for us to kind of sort through. So we can pull the constant out, and we can break the limits up. But if we do this, we're taking out a logical loan, I like to say. We're assuming that the limits which I'm expressing here in this current step are, in fact, limits which exist. If they don't, this step that I'm making right now, applying the product rule for limits, is total nonsense. But the good news is, is that the limits I'm writing here do in fact exist, right? Now, let me just talk about this one. So like here, the limit as x goes to 1 from the left of sine of x minus 1 over x minus 1. What we can do is we can say, oh, well, that's really the limit theta goes to 0 from the left and I make a theta equals to x minus 1 substitution, right? If theta is equal to x minus 1, if I make that substitution, as x goes to 1 from the left, what happens to, um, you know, theta? Do you guys see it? What's the limit as, like, x goes to 1 from the left of, of, of x minus 1? Yeah, it'd be zero. That's right, yeah. That is true. Um, but what I'm trying to, it still doesn't quite capture it. You're right, that's zero. So that's part of it. But why do I put the minus? Is it right to put the minus there? I think it is. See, because if x is a little bit less than one, then like x minus one is negative, right? So we're considering negative values of theta approaching zero. So it is instead, I keep the minus. I, I, I got to think through that. When you make a substitution, you could end up changing left to right if there was like a sign involved in the substitution, you should think about it. But this one does legitimately preserve the minus here, and then you just got sine theta over theta. But hey, we proved before the other day that this is equal to what? Remember, we gave this example in the squeeze theorem argument. I drew the unit circle. We made a, a geometric argument about the inequalities based on sine theta and tangent theta. And by the squeeze theorem, we derived that this limit is equal to one. So this is a known limit to us. We don't have to go through all that again. We can just say, oh, that's 1. So what's this equal to? C times 1. And how about this? Is there any trouble there? Plug in 1. What do you got? You got 1 over cosine of 0. What's cosine of 0? It's 1, right? So this is equal to C. <laughs> OK, well, that's kind of boring. But that works out to C, right? So to answer the question that I posed here, choose C such that this function is continuous at 1. What do I need to make C equal to? We need the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x to be equals to C, but it also has to be equal to f of 2, right? Which, by the way, is equal to the limit as x goes to 1 from the right um, of f of x, right? So C must be chosen to be, we must choose C to be 2 in order to have continuity at 1. If we make C equal to 2, then the left and the right limits are both equal, they match, and we've got continuity at 2. Does that make sense? There's a problem like this in your homework, so I wanted to work something kind of sort of like it. Okay, guys? So. Oh, also, um, somebody, 106. 106, there's the typo in 106 I need to make an announcement about. 106 has like, I think it says at zero at the end of the problem, but I meant to say at four because the gluing 
It's a case-wise defined function, and I'm at, I'd like to ask about continuity at four, like the place where the cases glue together. Otherwise, if I ask you if it's a continuous zero, that's a stupid question. Like, yes, obviously so, <laughs> because like the formula is a polynomial or a rational function without any kind of um, trouble at zero. I will make a formal announcement about this. I just thought I'd tell you since you're here. I was going to make a formal announcement last night, but I think um, I did this thing called sleep. So yeah, sorry about that. Always a problem, you know? All right, so let us go on. I need to talk to you guys about the intermediate value theorem. So what does the intermediate value theorem say? So there are some theorems in here which I can prove because the proof is at the level of the course and it's instructive. This is not one of those theorems. The proof of this theorem is actually somewhat technical and it really relies on the completeness property of the real number system. So a proof of this theorem necessarily involves the um, axiom of the real numbers which is called the least upper bound property. And so like proofs of this are a little bit technical. So we're just going to take it as something that's true. We're going to call it IVT and here's what the theorem says. It says that if f is a continuous function on a closed interval a to b and n is a value between f of a and f of b, all right, then there exists C in A to B for which F of C is equal to N. So there's, there's two different pictures here, guys, pretty much. So here's X, here's Y. Here's x, here's y, all right? So I say n is between f of a and f of b. What is that, what am I saying there? f of a and f of b, right? Either f of a is less than or equal to f of b, or f of b is less than or equal to f of a, right? Either a is, or you could say it more, sort of more, um, what's the word, um, colloquially, I can't say that word. Um, you know, either f of a is smaller or f of b is smaller. Like one of them is bigger than the other. I guess they could be equal, right? If f of a is equal to f of b, then this theorem is exceedingly silly because there's nothing in between them, right? <laughs> that would force n to be equal to f of a and f of b. But supposing then that, you know, it looks something more like this. You either got f of a is like here and f of b is up here to make it interesting. Or what do you got? f of b is down here and f of a is up here, right? Them's your choices pretty much. And so I'm saying n is a value between f of a and f of b. So like graphically, what does that mean? I can draw a picture, right? Like, it, you know, there's n is something in here, like so, right? n. Here's the graph y equals n, n y equals n. So n is a value between f of a and f of b. Now f is a continuous function, right? And a to b is a interval. It's a connected subset of real numbers, which means that the pre-calculus definition of continuity holds. We can draw the graph of a continuous function without lifting our marker, right? So the picture then has to look something like what? So we start at a comma f of a, right? And then we, there, we end at b. And we start here at that one, and then, oops. I'm 
of course, they don't have to wiggle like this, right? I'm just pointing out that they could wiggle like this and they'd be continuous. Uh, if I have drawn it such that it violates the vertical line test for shame, I'm not trying to do that. I, I do want this to be a function, all right? My point to you is that, th th so this, fun this funny symbol right here, you guys should ask me if you don't know, that means there exists. There exists, all right? So does there exist a constant in the middle such that, like, where's the C in this picture? There's more than one, right? So for, I mean, for the left one, I think I've got three choices for C. See that? This would work, this would work, and that would work, right? So like C, C, uh, any of these could be the C spoken of in this theorem, right? In this one, how many places do you hit the intermediate value? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have nine choices. Nine choices. These nine places are places where if you input those values, the output is equal to n, right? And so this is what the intermediate value theorem says. It says that if you have a continuous function, every value between the starting point and the ending point on a closed interval has to be attained, right? Our typical application, usual application of this theorem is what? If you have f of a is less than zero, is less than f of b, right? Or if you have f of uh, a is greater than zero, is greater than f of b, what's that mean for a closed interval and a continuous function? Zero is an intermediate value, right? That means there has to be a place between a and b where your function was zero. So this intermediate value theorem gives us an indirect way of kind of solving an equation, right? Now, it doesn't actually solve it, does it? It just says that there exists a C. So, you know, there's some questions in your homework about show that there exists a solution. If you see show there exists a solution, it's almost certainly a question that's asking you to use the intermediate value theorem. Let's try this out on some examples. All right. <clears throat> so example three. Let's Plus three 
if you say 